Whatever. I'm always going to compare my kids to Lauren's kid. She's the only other clear person in my kid. Lauren and I are kind of clear. Yeah. We got freaking Bradley over there. He's always tan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go to Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. That's Is it recording? Thing. Yeah. Okay, recording. That's oh, no. Um. All right, I'm trying not to talk because it's going to flip flop. Um, um, uh, flip flop to you. I want to keep it on this so we can save this, uh, save this training. All right, so I had messaged you guys about the cash offer program. Annie, so what'd you learn when you watched the video? I thought I had until Thursday. Oh, you thought you had until Thursday? Yes, you didn't. Did. So, what do you know about the cash offer program? I One of the things I really hate is when I say, hey, you guys should do this, and you don't, because it's all for you, not me, because I know how I to I really thought your training on Thursday, my bad. So you'd like to wait until the last minute for everything? I'm just putting you on the spot. What do you know about the cash offer program, or what do you want to know about the cash offer program that you don't know? What I want to know is how we come up with the offer price and how Homelight is willing to sit for that. Okay, so I... Um, let's differentiate something here. We're talking about the cash offer program for buyers. Yeah. Okay. How do, how, how do you come up with the cap, the offer price that you want to make an offer on on the house? Yeah, like do I have to get a, I have to get approval? Right? Okay. And how do they like? What do they decide what to approve it at? Right. Um. Did you did you watch the video? Yes. Okay. But I have been through that, so I, I'm very clear on cash offer program. Okay. You have to apply just like a regular pre-approval application process is the same. They have to get approved, and just like a loan, they'll get the cash offer, you know, amount approval amount, uh, approval amount. But then it's still based on the property that they want to submit the offer on. Yes, they will do the upfront appraisal and give you the amount that Home Life will allow, like the maximum that Home Life is comfortable yeah. submitting for that. Yeah, so you need to make sure that you're giving a little extra time in the offer negotiation. You can't send it to home like the day you need an offer out and and submit the offer. Mm -hmm. um, all of that is like after the fact. You, you, you know, it's it's more about you need to know enough to communicate to the buyer so you get an appointment or you get conversion on an appointment because. Uh, it's very rare that the buyers will actually utilize the program where it's more valuable for you is to like, and it's in the presentation even, right? You, you want to be explaining it as a value proposition to the client um, as why they should work with you versus just relying on like, do you like me? Am I, you know, I'm a good agent, right? Like these are, it's, it's, you're you're presenting it to the to the uh, prospect uh, along with all of your other options, and here's my unique value versus the traditional agent, and always comparing it to that, right? Always saying like, oh yeah, the normal agent can't give you this stuff, right? Because if if they're a first time home buyer, like you go through your presentation, they're like, oh yeah, that's cool, you, you know, they have no like real understanding that. That those things are unique, mm -hmm. and 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 you can't just go get them from a normal agent. You could, but most normal agents don't have the wherewithal or the education around these things, so they just don't offer them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But from a structural component, it's um, let's just say you get them pre-approved, right? Everyone, every client should get pre-approved for it, like. We should send them to Movement Mortgage and send them to uh, Home Light if they're in a price point that's competitive. You know, they get a pre-approval amount just like they're getting qualified for a mortgage. Um, when when she says like they get their approval amount, it just means they're pre-approved to this amount. And then once they land on a property, you submit the property address. Um, so step one, pre-approved. Step two, then you shop in between, right? And then when you find a property, you submit the property. I think they make you uh, submit a CMA mm -hmm. along with it. And it has to meet certain criteria. Can't, I don't think you can be on a well or septic or anything like that. Mm 
Same criteria for the instant offer program for sellers. There's also a bunch of FAQs in Nucleno. Um, it has the link to the website and all of that, where you can actually go in and look at the FAQs for the qualifications. Again, this stuff, you're not like communicating to the client on the first meeting, but what you are saying is you can simplify it down to the steps for them. Like the first step is we just get approved just like we normally would with a mortgage. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you two lenders to talk to. One is a traditional lender. The second is a lender that we can get you a cash offer program for. Mm -hmm. I want both of those approvals just in case we need it, we can use it. Make sense? Okay. So you, I would give yourself an extra 24 hours on submitting the property. They're pretty fast. Uh, you know, of any, any like third party um, platform, they are super responsive. I will say, like for uh, trade in, buy before you sell, all of that. Like our dedicated people at Homelike have been very responsive to me. Anyways, oh they are. I'm talking like, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever waited more than ten minutes for them to respond to an email mm -hmm. on Friday evening, Saturday, Sunday. These people at Homelike are working like they're part of the deal. Yeah. Like uh, that, that is that is awesome. So you would you would get pre-approved, submit the property with the CMA, right? And then number three is, um, you know, they're submitting. It's really a cash-backed offer in reality. So if you submit, let's just call it a cash-backed offer, meaning. Um, like if you submit with a 21 day close, if they, I think it's 21 days, you know, within 14 to 21 days, the program is free because they're calling it a cash backed offer, meaning they're going to use conventional financing. Um, but you could write it up as a cash offer because if you miss your window on conventional financing, they're going to close on day 21, uh, in cash. If it's like a seven day cash offer, they're going to charge a fee for that. Okay, meaning you want to write non contingent, you know, you want to close in six days, cash offer. And I think the fee currently is um, 1.5%, I think. But you, you, you need to confirm that because they're changing that all the time. <clears throat> what? I just said all the time on that fee. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, it's just bouncing all over, especially with rates and stuff. So, what happens when they buy? If you write a seven day cash offer is they buy the home for the client, right? Immediately at the same time, the client's opening escrow on the home with home light. Got it. So home light needs to acquire the home. Uh, you know, say it's a seven day closing. They then go into contract with the buyer and they have a conventional closing after that 21 days, 18 days, whatever the case may be. <laughs> Plus they're going to pay their fee to use the program. Um, <clears throat> the, I think one of the things that I, I've been hearing is, you know, because the market slowed down a little bit, the cash offer program is not as relevant. We never, I don't think we've ever had a closing with the cash offer program. I don't think anyone's ever written an offer, never tried it. Um, you have? My own personal property. Oh, oh that's right. Last you year. Exactly. Yeah, you did it last year? Yeah. How was the process? It was it was good, uh, a lot of communication back and forth. Um, but I think the key is to make sure you keep everything that they send you, because that's where we ran into issues of, towards the end of it, mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of our escrow. Uh, they wanted to do all new inspections when that's not what we agreed on. That's not what we signed on. Uh, oh, after they they closed? No, no. This was in the middle of escrow. So we, oh. we got to day 21. So we had a 21 day close. Yeah. We got to day 21. My loan was approved, but. The you cash close. offer wasn't approved because there was two items that were that showed up on the um, inspection report that they, they had, wanted fixed that they wanted to fixed. fund the loan. Yeah, and yeah. they didn't tell us that until day twenty. Uh, ah, yeah. they've gotten a little better on that end of it. Love but it. yes, like on buy before you sell, yeah, um, or <laughs> trade in or whatever you want to call it, they might approve the house. And then the buyer buy, you know, is buying their next home. They're getting financing, but before closing, the house needs X, Y, Z done and completed right. um, before they can close on their new home. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're going through that on Copper Creek right now, mm -hmm. um, where you know she has a paid-off home 
you know, she's she's getting by before you sell like 830K. She wrote a non-contingent offer in, um, I don't know, Edmond, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, and and so she's just writing a cash offer with home light on that. She has a few repairs she needs to make prior to closing. Mm -hmm. uh, they might ask that on the cash offer program, right? right? You write an offer, it doesn't matter what you and the seller negotiate. They actually might require that certain repairs be made mm -hmm. um, on that property to close on the property, even if the seller doesn't agree to them. So somehow you're going to have to negotiate, like the buyer's going to have to pay for the repair. Or someone's going to have to pay for the repair until the buyer can actually close with uh, home light. Does that make sense? How do they know the repairs have been done? The, you'd verify it. You have to send, you have to send an invoice. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to send the invoice and and proof that repairs are done. So um, that's one thing from from like a transaction management standpoint that I'd recommend you guys pay attention to on on that end. What other questions about the cash offer program do you do you have? Everyone's looking at me like kind of like I'm lost. You're clear. You got it. Why would it be important to say we can give a buyer a cash offer? It differentiates us. That's 100% true. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Puts the buyer in a better spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a sense of if you pitch it the right way to the listing agent, in a sense, it's almost a guaranteed sell if your offer gets accepted with the cash offer program. Yeah. And so it, it alleviates the any issues that the seller has with regards to falling out of escrow for whatever reason. Um, you that hits the nail on the head for the um for the uh the feeling okay. that cash offer was not uh at just as powerful last year, right? <laughs> Even though you could get offers accepted conventional financing, eliminating the risk for the seller will always get you a uh, a better deal on the house. So <laughs> In our buyer consultation, um, in our communication with buyers on the phone, before the consultation to set the appointment, I would just be using this as your hook, right? Meaning I can share with you a way that we're saving our clients thousands of dollars by helping them write cash offers on homes. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean by that? Well, that's why it's important that we meet, right? So I can share with you how I can get you approved to write a cash offer. Mm -hmm. Look at how insane people went for the dream program. Mm -hmm. Got it? That is just a, um, a making an offer for immediate response, right? The same things that I train you and teach you, instant offer, concierge, cash offer for buyers. You know, the dream program is just that. It's a program to spark interest and excitement. There's no reason why you, you can't uh, offer the cash offer program and just say, hey, I can save you 5%, 10% on, on whatever house we purchase by offering with cash versus a traditionally financed mortgage. The other key is they have to be pretty well qualified. Um, they have to have good credit, a decent amount of money down. I don't know what the uh, exact requirement is right now, but I would say anybody over 10% down is a good candidate, but anything under that, like government loans, FHA loans, no go. Mm -hmm. Were you going to ask a question? You answered my question. Oh, what kind of financing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like VA won't, won't fly. VA, FHA, that kind of stuff will not fly. These are for conventional buyers, you know, 5% down, 10% down, 15% down. So the, the key reasons why it's important, differentiation for us against everyone else, right? No risk for the seller if we write a cash offer. I would say the number one reason, savings to the buyer. Period. Like even though if you look at the whatever the fee is right now, 1.5, 1.75, um, with most lenders, you're paying around a uh, point to two points anyways to get financing. So I would not look at, you know, well, you know, if you say, well, the cash offer has a fee, right? It's just a loan fee. Like when, you, when your clients use movement mortgage, they're not getting that mortgage for free, right? So movement charges money to do the financing. 
so does home life. You just get this added advantage that uh, the fee is 1.5% to borrow cash for 30 days, which is pretty incredible. And so if you if you get objections about that fee from the buyer, that's the response. Well, we're going to pay a loan fee points costs anyways, no matter what lender we use. So why not why not leverage this option so we can write offers in cash because we're going to see savings. And I would say the savings is pretty real. I would say between one and five percent, sometimes more on on many properties. And they could probably buy properties that they couldn't buy um, with conventional financing if it needs work, something like that. They can actually buy properties that might have issues with appraisals and that kind of thing. Um, the desktop appraisal that they do is just to make sure that when we are writing offers, like over asking and that kind of stuff, that, that there won't be any appraisal issues. And since they're the owner and lender on the other side, I'm pretty sure they have a lot more flexibility if the appraisal does come in low. I, I remember them teaching us about that like two years ago, where that that desktop appraisal is just to make sure the offer we want to make is within the realm of what the market will bear on the house. I have a question about that. For Hickson, the desktop uh, desktop appraisal was um, five. 54, 545 or 554 something, but we our offer was supposed to be 572. So they said that at that time, if it, it doesn't appraise for that, then the sell, buyer would have to come out of pocket for that. Which but, is normal. Which is normal, but yeah. the buyer was super confused. Like, hey, um, if we are waiving all the appraisal contingencies, I won't have extra money to come out of pocket. Mm -hmm. Because in, in traditional loans, you negotiate then with the seller, like, hey, appraisal came in low, we want to offer less or whatnot. Well, that that whole process doesn't have anything to do with home life, right? Mm -hmm. If you're submitting your offer with no appraisal contingency, um, then yes, the buyer would be committed to, to covering that difference. With home life, their standard is if it comes in under the appraised value, if you want that cash offer loan, you have to cover that difference. Uh, the buyer has to cover that difference. Yeah, no, what my question is that it uh, then how is the cash offer going to give them any leverage? Because they can't waive the appraisal even with the cash offer. They can. But they if can. If they waive the appraisal, then they have to come out of pocket. And if they don't have enough money to come out of pocket, then, then they can't waive it. Then they can't waive it. Right? Yeah. So, well, I mean, the answer to your question is mm -hmm. the cash offer gives them leverage. The buyer just needs to be willing to write the offer that they are writing, right? right. Because, you, you, you know, the only way that it works, I mean, you can still, the buyer has to be all in on the property. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Buyer was all in. They just didn't have that 30 pounds of extra cash yeah. to be able to close if they needed to. Yeah. Did what? Did the appraisal come in low, or did it come in fine, or? Um, they went the conventional loan route with home life. It came in at offer price. Okay, so it would not have been an issue. So it would not have been an issue, despite the desktop appraisal coming in low. Yeah, the desktop okay. is always going to be probably a little low. Okay. Right. So just that—that's not a home life thing. That's a client okay. uh, education thing. Yes. And you still want to be careful removing all contingencies, but yes, in that scenario, the buyer is going to need to be willing to, just like if they're writing an offer conventionally, they're going to need to be willing to, if they remove their appraisal contingency, pay the difference. Mm -hmm. If there's multiple offers, I guess the key is if there's multiple offers in any instance, um, you know, you, you're probably going to have to wind up removing those contingencies to win, and the buyer's got to be willing to do that and assume that, and if not, um, it is it is what it is, mm -hmm. right? You can still put an appraisal contingency in uh, into those cash offers. Mm -hmm. You can just be clear we're leveraging a cash offer loan, and they just want to confirm the appraisal comes in at value. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah. So you can still put that in there mm -hmm. and not have a loan contingency, and just make sure the appraisal is in there. But mm -hmm. um, like the real value of the program is to use it as the hook to do in the consult, get the cons first and foremost, get a consult second on the consult, give you a few arrows in your quiver other than do you like me or not. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that way you're kind of giving buyers options mm -hmm. and making sure that you're exploring those options and then getting them approved for it. That way, if you need to utilize it, or if it's going to be to their advantage to utilize it, 
you steer them into that program. Make sense? And and I would just say there's just no one consulting them on this on 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 this strategy. Just like you guys are leveraging trade in and, and concierge heavily at your open house open houses and getting people to talk to you about it and getting listing appointments from that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's just a, it's a tremendous tool to get conversion. If you didn't have concierge and trade-in, you wouldn't have those appointments and those yeah. conversations, right? It's, yeah. it's that simple. You're just throwing that hook out there and they're like, oh, what's that about? You, you know, just a way to bring down the wall, like you're a salesperson and, and you have something that they don't know about. Does that make sense? So really look at it from that perspective. Annie, are you following here? Do you feel like you can comfortably communicate this to a buyer at this point? Yeah. I'm going to watch screen clean up in two. Okay. I feel like I sell it to clients all the time in our consult, but my issue is the client I already have writing offers. But honestly, based on what you're saying, I don't think it would have been useful in the offer that we just wrote because they're not willing to cover an appraisal gap of that value. Well, much but not every, not every offer you write uh, is going to be a multiple offer situation or over asking. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, but they're well qualified already. Like we're removing the one thing to do already. Yeah, but um, let's say you have an offer, Garland, for example. Mm -hmm. You write an offer. What? What? What is it? Seven twenty-five, or what's the price again? Seven twenty-five. Okay. Well, what if they could have written um, six ninety cash, and the seller would have accepted that over the seven oh five offer offer. I mean, every offer right now that we're writing is a multiple offer situation. Everyone is right now. Right. Uh, most of them are right now. Not everyone. No, I'm just talking about my buyers, like the, the uh, homes we're writing on. Like they're all multiple offers. Okay. So do you think that a cash offer program would be advantageous for them? Or like you don't have to write substantially over asking to, to get the cash offer accepted. Does that make sense? So the point is the cash offer is going to always be more um, advantageous for the seller to accept. You don't have to be the highest offer to win. So let's say the property is, is listed for 525 and you and you consult your client. You say, hey, let's use the cash offer program going at 530. Remove your loan and appraisal and your I don't want to that appraisal. That's the problem. Then you need to consult them, get back in front of them, and educate them on what it means to remove it. Um, and as long as you feel that that property is priced well, there should be no reason that the appraisal comes in at. It's just very rare to have an appraisal come in low, mm -hmm. especially if you're doing your due diligence and you know the property is priced well. I oh, mean, yeah. So, I mean, if it's over 10 grand, do they have 10 grand? Yeah, we did an appraisal gap on the last one. I don't, okay. so, I don't know if it would appraise. That's why I um, advised them to do the appraisal gap, but I don't know if it would have appraised or not. So they are willing to bring some money to the table. Oh, some money for sure. But mm -hmm. like in Nikki's situation, when they may have been on the hook 30 grand, like that's a lot. So they wouldn't have been able to do that. They can't do that? Or do you feel well. they can't do that? They wouldn't be willing. Yeah. Based on the conversations they've had. Mm -hmm. So I would just say um, in 90% of scenarios, this program is going to work just fine. Yeah. And the savings, the real savings that they get by being more certain to the seller um, is going to save them more than the fee costs and win them the property. So I don't know how many offers we've written in the last two weeks, but I, can, I know how many escrows we've opened and it's like zero, right? So we've had probably eight offers go out. Imagine if you can increase that by 30%. I mean, that's advantageous for me. See all these offers go out and no escrows. Part of me is saying, well, why are we not leveraging this, right? Mm -hmm. This is a way to help you get um, clients at least a little bit of an, an advantage in a, in a multiple offer situation. And it costs them no money, right? In reality, it, it's, gonna, it's not gonna cost them any money if you factor being the best, strongest turned offer. And are you guys also making sure you're making contact with these listing agents? You're calling them, you're texting them, you're getting on the phone with them? Yeah, yeah. yeah we just want to make sure that we're just the sweet, squeakiest wheel for sure. Can we leverage the cash offer to offer on a brand new bill? Since it's cash, they can't. Make I don't things. think 
that they are willing to do it in new construction. Yeah. Um, there's all kinds of um, there's all kinds of carve outs for both buy before you sell and the. I just have a feeling in new construction they want to stay away from it. Yeah. Because in reality, when you use the cash offer program, there is risk. Home like is stuck with that home. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like home like. The buyer could say, never mind, I don't want to buy the home, right? So home like has to sell that home. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So they are careful. That's why there are criteria. That's why they, they do run it through, you know, a process to make sure that, that it's legit. Mm -hmm. When we write the offer, you can still write it as a conventional offer and just use it as a cash back offer, right? Meaning like what we were, I mean, we were doing that ourselves for a long time, right? That's true. And so we're, we're basically guaranteeing 21 day close, 18 day close that, that if we don't hit our closing date, we're going to close in cash, right? You will be the only offer. Just like when we were doing, running our own cash backed offer program, you will be the only offer that, that has that. And judging by like the amount of offers we wrote in the last couple of weeks, like we need to do something to get an advantage. And I would just implement this right away because the problem will become your clients will start to get discouraged. You're going to lose clients. They're going to stop. They're going to quit. They're, they're not going to be mad at you. They're just going to say, "Never mind. I'm not buying a house right now. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you, you know, I think it's important. You don't want to go, you don't want to take too many shots, right? With offers. Imagine if you can just cut that in half, right? The number of offers you write. I mean, that's escrows for you. The problem is, is if you miss one, it could take three, four weeks for them to find another home that they like, mm -hmm. right? So there's two things that you can do to help you get that client in contract. Number one is, is uh, influence them more to write better offers, okay? We talked about this on the phone with repairs, and I think it goes back to um, even the consult stage, right? Which is... Um, <clears throat> Sometimes we allow our own feelings and our own expectations to, to like drive our communication to the client and the advice to our client, right? Like what we feel we know and how we feel, we then project and communicate onto our client and that 100% drives the way that they feel. Does that make sense? So if we're uncertain about something like an appraisal or we're unsure if it will appraise or not, and we communicate that to the client, the second they sense that uncertainty, they are uncertain about everything, right? Not just the appraisal, they're just not sure, period. So it's hard to get them to, um, to get out of their own way if we can't get out of our own way, <laughs> you know, in that process. So, um, uh, you know, one of the po the points I'll try to teach you is like the the level of influence that we have on a client is very high, even if we don't believe it to be so, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, um, Annie, I'm just gonna pick on you for a second. We we have a repair issue on uh, Garland that um, it's not a huge issue, but it's just caused uh, some grief for like a week and a half. Right. And um, it's a very minor, it's turned out to be a very minor issue, very, no big deal. It's the baseboard, whoever held it open knows what that is. Like the cat peed on the baseboard and, and it was gross. Um, but the client hasn't had a resolution or confidence for like two weeks. It's ambiguous. He, no one's been able to answer for him confidently that there is no water leak, there's no standing water. You know, he in his mind, there's moisture in there and it's coming from somewhere, but no one knows where, right? Um, the way I would have communicated it to him, if it was my client, I would have said, there's no leak going on here, right? Uh, the seller agreed to make the repair prior to closing. The seller agreed that if anything regarding water or leaks or anything is, you know, they just agreed it will be fixed, it will be gone. Right. That happened like two weeks ago. It was already agreed to. But in his mind, he just keeps thinking about it. He wants to pull back carpet, open up walls, 
he wants to make sure that there's no leak there, right? Um, and and for me, if that was my client, immediately when the repairs are negotiated, great. Now we know that that's going to be fixed prior to closing. There is no issue here. There's no concern. We'll get the invoice once it's done. You can be rest assured. I can't guarantee anything, but I know that uh, if there is a leak over two weeks it, or, or over four weeks, it would have gotten worse. So you can rest assured we've had someone look at it. They said it's not an active leak. Take it as they say it is, right? Mm -hmm. And then if something's worse when they're fixing it, they're just, you know, it's not our problem, it's theirs. But for two weeks, he festered and worried and, you know, it's, it's not closed for him, right? He was he didn't have certainty uh, until today when the repair was actually made, right? But you know, as I thought, when the repair is made, when it's opened up, no issue, right? Fixed, no problem. All that worry, all that time, all his concern, his stress, right? Yeah. Um, could have been alleviated. Now, we're not 100% sure. I, I would tell him that even though I'm not, I can't be guaranteed accurate. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make to you. Most of the advice that you give when you give it you can't guarantee it. Mm -hmm. If you're not okay with that, you're going to run into it. If you're not okay with that and you and you can't project confidently without 100% accuracy, you're going to run into issues because your clients are always going to be unsure, right? You have to get good at using language like, um, I can't guarantee this to you, but I've seen this before and I have experience with it. So let's not stress about it. It's just, this, this is really a small issue in the grand scheme of things. Let's not stress about it. It's, it's agreed to, or it's gonna be fixed. Appraisal issue, right? We're gonna write an offer 10K over. Highly doubt there's gonna be an appraisal issue. Like we're going 10K over. It's not like we're 50,000 over. Um, you know, I doubt there's gonna be an issue. This is the only way to win the house, right? You either write this offer and we are in the running to win, or we just don't write an offer at all, right? I'm trying to save you the grief. If you had to pay an extra 10 grand, would you do it? Yes, most cases, yes. They say, yes, great, let's just do that, right? Forget about appraisal and what it means and all of that. Like, if you can afford an extra 10K, let's do it. Or even better, let's go 15K to make 100% sure that you don't lose this house over five grand, mm -hmm. right? What if I call you tomorrow, you, you know, communicating with your buyer? What if I called you tomorrow and said the, the next best offer was 15,000 and you were at 10? Would you would you say to me in that moment, Steve, I would have paid the extra five because 10 out of my last 10 clients would say they would have paid the extra five. Mm -hmm. So let's just skip that step in the, in the opportunity of potentially losing the house and let's just make this best offer now, right? The, um, if you're doing that, oh, hold on. If you're doing that and you're like, oh, I'm not sure about the appraisal. Um, if you're worried about the appraisal, let's just not let's just not write that in. Or I'm not sure what the highest offer is. We'll get a counter offer, or um, we can always counter higher in the event that we that we are not the highest offer. Um, if you're going into it kind of like without certainty, mm -hmm. I would say it's just going to affect your ability to. You're going to win more often than not, the more confident you are in the advice that you give. Even if you're not 100% sure, it's totally accurate. You know why, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you be strategic about how you communicate because you don't want to be wrong and then look stupid, right? Mm -hmm. But I've had that happen where I'm like, I'm 100% sure this is not an issue. Mm -hmm. And then it, it's an issue, right? But nine and a half times out of 10, it's not an issue. But I can assure you, if you're not confident and nipping that kind of stuff in the butt right away, the 10 out of 10 times, it's going to be a stressful issue. You're going to have tons of cancellations. You know, your, your buyers are going to be unsure. They're going to cancel way more often if you're not like setting them up properly mm -hmm. or at least educating them in a way where they feel really confident. Does that make sense? What were you going to say? Um, it, it might be off topic, but it was real quick on that appraisal thing. I feel like everyone's running into that right now. Um, in those situations, what you can do sometimes, and it's setting the client up first, right? You get everybody on the same page, the lender also. Get that appraisal just rush ordered, right? You can have it back in that inspection contingency timeframe, and then you can let the buyer know, hey, 
we're going to write this on there. We're going to rush to get this appraisal done. You're going to pay 200 bucks extra to make sure it's done right away. You're going to sign everything right away that you need. And then if that comes in low, you know, this is what we'll do, right? This is the plan for it. So just something real quick on like for that appraisal stuff. You can do that. Would you waive um, the appraisal then, the contingency? Uh, depending on the buyer, right? And that's totally up to them. And you let them know, I let my clients know before, hey, I can waive this on here and we're gonna, we're technically gonna hide it in this other contingency. If this all goes bad, this is what it looks like. They force us to remove our inspection contingency and our appraisal report's not back yet. If we feel like it's gonna be far off and we're just not comfortable with it, we're gonna have to cancel. You're gonna be out the money for inspections and appraisal, right? But that's better than possibly having to, you know, pay an extra fifteen, twenty thousand dollars if that comes in low. Right. And as long as they know that, in all honesty, they, they trust you with it. They say, okay, cool. That's that's the plan. You let the lender know, hey, I need this order day one. What if it comes in low, but they want like they still want the home they want to negotiate at that point if they remove the contingency. You that you're letting them know up front, right? Hey, we remove this, you guys lose all ability to negotiate. So you just have to pull out. Hmm? You yeah, you can out. forfeit yeah. deposit. Yeah, I mean, if I think the key goes back to, and that's a really good piece of advice, like 100%. Sure. The, the first and foremost right now is that needs to be done at the consult. If we're not running good consults and we're not explaining this process at the consult, you're running into issues at the end. Like, we should not run into that issue at offer stage, like explaining or having them worried about appraisal contingencies. We should know if they're willing to remove that contingency or have the financial capability at console. Does that make sense? At the initial buyer console? Hundred percent. Yes. If it's a qualified buyer and you're going to be moving forward with them, mm -hmm. like you should know and have a discussion with them. Even last year, if it was a good house at a good price, they were still getting multiple offers. Like even though most homes weren't selling with multiples. If it was a good house, good price point, there was more than one buyer, right? So we should not drop that from our cons consultation, right? One of the screening questions on leads was, do you have how much money do you have? Same screening question today. Now someone with less money, less cash in the bank can, can get a home today, but we still don't want to skip that process of, by the way, if there's multiple offers, it's less common today than it was a year ago. But many buyers are removing their contingencies for appraisals, which means we might get to the point where if you fall in love with the house, I might advise the only way to get the house is to remove the contingency, right? I just need to know, are you willing to do that or not, right? And of course, we don't know what the price range is, or I'm always going to get, you know, and this is where that influence comes from, because in that consult, I, I'm I'm just um, getting earning their trust more and more. And I'll say things like, of course, I would never let you overpay for a home, right? You're my client, I'm a fiduciary. I'll never let you do that. But just because you pay over appraised value doesn't mean you're overpaying for a home, right? It just means that values have not caught up with, or since there's so few closings because inventory is so low, they just can't get the right comps to show that the values are there. But if there's 10 offers and you're one of them, value's there. Right, because there's 10 people willing to buy it. Right. So if you don't do that with your client, if you don't explain that whole process, right? When you do get to the point of when you're writing offers and now there's multiples and they're surprised and they're thinking, I'm not gonna do that, right? Um, that's where you run into a lot of issues. And it doesn't mean just because you do it at the consult, they're gonna they're gonna want to do that. They don't always want to remove the contingency or they can't. But at least you know it's going to save you time because you're already going to know before you go look at a home if there's three offers and uh, contingencies are removed, you're going to skip that home because you you did that prep work in the in the consult. Does that make sense? So you know default one is going to offering an amount over, like putting an appraisal gap, and I, I would say of of all the listings that I've listed this year. I would say maybe two of them had the appraisal contingency removed. So it's not like every home is, is getting that level of, of offer. Um, but so I, I wouldn't worry too much about that situation coming to light. What I would say though, is you need to have the discussion at the time of the consult. Maybe you don't do it on every consult in the middle, but when you know you got an active client that's moving forward, 
sign the buyer agreement, then you say, great, let's talk about the nuts and bolts of this process now, mm -hmm. right? Here's how much you're going to need for your deposit. Here's how much your inspections are going to cost. I need to talk to you about competitive offer situations because I'm finding my buyers are competing in a lot of situations. That's a good thing. People are buying real estate again, right? Values have stabilized. You should have more confidence to buy today when no one's buying homes as my buyers were not wanting to write offers, right? They don't want to be the one that buys when everyone else is not buying. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So, so you need to have that. That's where your leverage comes for, for influence is getting that buy-in on the initial consult. You do not want to have to work backwards when you get to the point at which she offered. This is where you run into the issues of, well, they need to write one or two offers to get used to the market. Um, that does need to happen sometimes, but I'm convinced you could probably do a better job of that on your consult, and they don't need to do that one or two times. By the time they get to the first home, they already kind of know what the market's like. Um, Nick used to do a thing where he would show buyers what they were listed for, what they were versus what they were sold for on the consult, mm -hmm. right? You can do things like that to prep them and set them up, yeah. right? And then best case scenario, when you get to the offer, they, they want to write on the home they love. There's no multiple offers and you guys are good, right? So it just comes down to influence matters, how you approach that client matters. Um, you know, pinging on your programs is important and, and just don't underestimate like our confidence level in how we're communicating to a client is what sets the tempo of how the client feels about whatever situation they're in. Does that make sense? Like if you're not confident when you say something to the client, they're not going to feel confident about it. it and the second you're not confident, boom, they're, they lose all confidence and it, it never comes back. You can't like regroup after that and say, never mind, never mind. I'm like, I'm more confident in this now. No, it doesn't work like that, right? The second a buyer's like, whoa, I, I'm not sure. The second that happens, boom, it's it's over, Ooh. right? So, you, you know, that that can, you know, and other learning experiences is like setting their expectations before inspections. We talked about that. We've talked about that before. You know, every home report is 130 pages long. If you don't tell them that one simple thing when they get the home report, they're like, oh my God, this house is like, you know, destroyed. <laughs> Yeah. Right. My home inspection has so many things on it. Well, yeah, every home inspection has so many things on it. It's like, you know, 97 point inspection mm -hmm. and they always take pictures. They always detail everything out. Right. But if you're not confident up front in explaining that, uh, I promise you, if your client uh, like reacts the way that way to inspections, your risk of cancellations is much higher and you have no control of your client after that. Mm -hmm. That's when they're saying, I want this whole list of things fixed mm -hmm. and, and that's what I want, right? And now you're trying to battle them over and then they don't have confidence in you because you're battling them over repairs and they're like, well, you're supposed to be on my side, mm -hmm. right? And, and you're saying, well, no, we only ask for health and safety repairs and they're like, no, I want all these. These are health and safety repairs. But the only reason they don't know that is because you didn't tell them ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And it's way too late once they have it in their mind, right? So like we're talking about that on the phone. It's way too late for that guy to be confident until he has a picture and a signed agreement from a, a contractor, right? Even the contractor calling him and saying, no, it's not a big issue. This is what I think it is, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't enough for him after he already had time to like... In his mind, he's like, this is a this is an issue, right? So the faster you resolve something and the more confident you are when you resolve it, the better off you'll be. Okay, speed, you know, the speed at which you like jump on things matters a lot, mm -hmm. right? Like it's called eating the frog. Just approach it, get it done, um, you know, um, just get it done. Just call them confidently. Here's a good example. Zach, our listing on Zachis was supposed to close on Friday. The guy has like Alzheimer's and, and he's very early, but he forgets everything, right? Um, 
And he also gets really uh, concerned and anxiety if something's not exactly as we said it was going to be, which is a hard thing in real estate because nothing is ever exactly. And you know his problem is when we have a contract, do the does the contract not mean anything? If our you know contingency is due on this, why is it not off, right? Or the deposit says it's this, why is it not mine, right? There's no there's total ambiguity in real estate, even though there's, there's a contract, none of it applies really. Does that make sense? Like even the you know appraisal contingencies on the date, it doesn't automatically fall off, even though you agree to it. You have to both agree to remove it. Yeah. yeah. So there's no there's no cut and dry point A and point B. So we were supposed to close on Friday. I had two meetings on Friday, and we'll cut out here in a second. Um, late in the evening, and the lender sent out an email at like three o'clock saying, like, hey, we're delayed. The file's still at Calhafa. It was a dream program. Um, we're, we're still at Calhafa, and you know, we need an extension until May 10th. And I'm like, we're supposed to close today. What 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 the F have you been doing for all week? You know, I have, I've been following up for two days trying to find out what's going on. And but he he texted me at like not uh, nine o'clock at night. Thanks so much, Steve. We're already on the road. We're you know, I'm like, shit, man. And I have appointments until like eight, you, you know, mm -hmm. and and so, you know, I didn't tell him on Friday that it didn't close. Right. He's like, when should I see the money in my bank account? Blah, blah, blah. Well, on Saturday, I was trying to get answers from Title and the lender. No one was responding to me because it was Saturday, right? And um, and then we had something family stuff, and and I need, and I just totally spaced Saturday afternoon to call them. Sunday still had no answers from Title or or agent or lender. And um, he texted me. I gave him a window of time to call because I had my kids, and he missed the call, and I couldn't call him. And so Sunday went by, couldn't tell him. And he's like texting me Monday. He's like, hey, Steve, I don't have the money in my bank account. Is something wrong, right? And uh, we try to connect. And I, and of course, that in my mind, I'm thinking he's going to, he's going to fucking explode. You, you know, he's going to be so mad when I tell him this, right? And I felt bad that he's having to wait from uh, Friday until Monday. And he thinks his home is closed and he's driving to Colorado, right? Like his home's closed. He gets his money. He's done. Um and so I finally talked to him uh, Monday night and I told him, hey man, I'm so sorry, here's what happened. You know, I've never had this happen before where we found out the day of closing that we're delayed. Um, you know, I wish I had the information to give you sooner. This is what I was trying to tell you over the weekend, blah, blah, blah. And he was, he was confused. Like, how can that happen if we have a date we're supposed to close, you know? He was the kind of guy when, when he signed the closing documents, you know, how come they didn't have my check when I signed? You, you know, he thinks closing is when they sign paperwork, right? And so I had to kind of tell him what happened and why. But after the call, this is one of those moments where as an agent, you avoid doing the hard things because you are projecting your thinking. You think you know what's going to happen when you talk about it or you do it. Mm -hmm. Like I assumed that he was going to be pissed because he had been pissed in several other instances. But as, as I had the call and as we hung up, he's like, oh, I guess, you know, it is what it is. Let me know when it's closed. You know, it's, it is what it is, right? As long as it closes this week, I'm happy, right? Way less friction than I thought it would be. Yeah. Okay. So if, you know, never avoid something, if, because you think it's going to be one way. Nick, I've trained you on this a million times. Yeah, for years, right? We we call it future fucking is what it's called, right? Part of my French on the video. But it's 100% it's true. You avoid things because you think, you know, this happens in relationships. This happens everything. Like, oh, I think my spouse is going to be mad about this, right? Oftentimes we overcomplicate it. We pump it up in our own mind. But when we have the conversation, not a big deal, mm -hmm. right? So the faster you get to those things and the more direct you are about them, the better off it will be. Make sense? The stronger you're going to be as an agent, the more confident you communicate, mm -hmm. okay? So your, your clients, 100%, they feel it when their lead 
when you're on the phone with them, right? This skill of managing clients is going to benefit you all the way up until when you meet someone one-on-one -on -one at an open house. The more confidence you have, hey, how's it going? My name is Steve. How long have you been looking for a home, right? The more confidence and direct you are in, the, in that instance, the more you offer to close and say, hey, I want to do business with you. The less about like, oh, give me a call, you know, if if you guys decide you want to buy or sell in the future, right? The less you do that stuff and the more you're like, this is how it is and this is why you should work with me, the better off you're going to be. Got it? Mm -hmm. Okay, we got to go. Can you send that to me? Yep. Okay. Mm.